Amen. Amen. All right, tonight we're in Genesis chapter number 36. Um, last week we concluded, of course, Genesis chapter number 35. And uh, it detailed uh, basically Jacob settling in, settling back into the land of Canaan with his new family. He settled back into the land and of course uh, we saw a few different uh, pretty prominent events take place. Uh, we saw uh, Rebecca's nurse die. We also saw that Rachel died. Uh, we, and then another thing was uh, pretty much uh, uh, the majority of what was going on was he traveled back to Bethel. And during that time, what he was doing was he was rededicating his life to serving God. And he was also uh, doing so for his, in his entire family. He was making this decision for his entire family. Now it ended in G Genesis uh, 35 also with Isaac dying. So Isaac finally passed away. Of course, he was, he was sick years and years before that. We, and uh, it seemed as if uh, he thought he was going to die you know, when uh, Jacob had ended up fleeing away. You know, 20 years went by, maybe even more than that, depending on how long Jacob was settled into the land in Canaan. And then he eventually did pass away. And it mentions Esau again there in verse number 29. So if you look at 35, 29, Genesis 35, verse 29 says, And Isaac gave up the ghosts and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And then it says, And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So of course this is the end of the life of Isaac. And Esau hadn't been mentioned uh, for a chapter or so. Um, when uh, he wasn't focused on it all for a while. So he was kind of entered back into the equation when Jacob had, had then arrived in Canaan again. Now it's a perfect time to mention him. And that's actually what Genesis chapter 36 is about. It is about the generations of Esau. It's just speaking of uh, the generations or the progenitors uh, uh, that, uh, or ac the ancestry of, of uh, Esau, if you will. It's the ancestry of Esau. So that's what we're going to begin with here in verse number 1. It actually tells you the purpose of the chapter, the theme of the chapter. Genesis chapter number 36, verse number 1 tells us, Now these are the generations of Esau, and then it tells you who is Edom. So of course Esau was also referred to as Edom, and the entire nation uh, becomes known by Edom. And, and not only that, just like the nation of Israel will sometimes be referred to as Jacob, uh, as is Edom and Esau. Sometimes uh, the nation of Edom will also be referred to as Esau because it is just another name that that person was given. So Jacob was just given a new name by God. He was given the name Israel. And then going forward, they referred to the nation as Israel. But there are scores and scores of times. I mean, 50, 60, 70 times probably. Probably between 50 and 100 times if I had to estimate how many times the nation of Israel is also referred to as Jacob. I mean, that may even be a low ball number. It's many, many, many times. We see the same thing when you're reading throughout the Old Testament. Uh, the nation of Edom is also referred to as Esau many times. Edom is just another name for Esau. Many times the Bible people had multiple names. Look at verse number 2. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Ahalabama the daughter of Ana the daughter of Zibion the Hivite. Verse 3, and Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. And verse 4, and Ada bare to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashamath bare real. Now in verse number uh, 2 through 3, there is an apparent contradiction. There is an apparent contradiction. It appears that there is a contradiction. Not between these two verses. That's not where the conflict lies. Brother Russell had brought this up to me uh, you know, uh, about a month or so ago. Maybe two months. Um, and I'm going to, towards the end, I have illustration. I have a board over here uh, that I'm going to use to give you uh, the possible answer answers of how to make sense of the passages which seem to conflict. Now I'll go ahead and say this now and I'm going to get into this further later. Of course we believe that the King James Bible is perfect. We believe that it is perfect and pure. God promised to preserve His Word. And there are things in the Bible that I believe are stumbling blocks unto the infidel. That's what they are. They are stumbling blocks uh, to the unbeliever. And oftentimes when you study these things out, those that have faith in the Word of God and they stay steadfast, 
When they come out on the other side, they just have strengthened their faith in the Word of God. Not only that, you end up learning something most of the time. That's what happens most of the time when you, when you look into these and you study these, what seem to be apparent contradictions or, or supposed contradictions in the Bible, right? But we'll go to that at the end. Tonight's sermon's probably not going to be very long. The majority of this is, uh, it is uh, as I'm sure you heard, it's the generations of Esau, as I had mentioned already, too, and as you heard. Uh, we're going to keep reading there, verse number 5. It says, And Aholabama bear Jeush and Jalem and Korah. These are the sons of Esau which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle, excuse me, and all his beasts and all his substance which he had got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. Now I want to stop here and uh, um, give you the doctrine pretty much that you're going to get for tonight. You're going to get here in the beginning. Uh, first thing I want to point out how this is interesting, that Esau is dwelling in the land of Canaan. Jacob moves and comes to the land of Canaan, and Esau is the one who ends up leaving. And it, it, it almost seems like it's voluntary, right, doesn't it? It almost seems like it, he willingly leaves. If you look at verse number uh, uh, 7, it says, For their riches were more than that they might dwell together. So they had too much possessions for them both to live together. And the land wherein they were, strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Now who was living there previously? Whose home was this uh, for a, a long period of time? Of course it was Esau's home, right? This is where he stayed here. This is where he was dwelling, at least in this general vicinity. He may have moved around some, you know, a few times, but uh, th that's speculation. He was the one dwelling here. And isn't it kind of interesting that when Jacob comes in, Esau's the one that leaves. When you would almost you know, think that that would be inverted. You'd almost think that that would be the exact opposite, where Esau was the one that was there. Uh, there's a couple of uh, what I think, because this is interesting, this is here for a, a reason. There's a couple of things that, that are uh, possible about what's going on here. Number one, God may have put it into his heart for him to move. Number two, he may have already understood Hey, Jacob's getting the blessing. That blessing was given to Abraham, to Isaac, and then ended up being given to Jacob instead of Esau. And what was the blessing when it was clarified to Abraham? Where, what were they getting? They were getting that land specifically. The, the blessing was that property, that particular land. That's exactly what was over and over again specified to Abraham. Esau is aware of that. He knows what the blessing is. He was well aware that there was a blessing. Isaac spoke to him about the blessing. And isn't it funny that Esau is the one that ends up packing up his things and leaving? Now, that's not coincidental. Whatever ends up happening there, whatever the purpose is, I don't believe at all that that's coincidental, that he's the one that ends up getting all of his stuff and saying, hey, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go here. When the, we know that that land was given to Jacob. We know that that promise was given to Jacob. I want you to turn to Hebrews Excuse me, chapter number 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Now, we, a lot of us have a very dim view of Esau. Of Esau. And, and where we're about to turn right now, Hebrews 12, is, is pretty much uh, the reason why I believe that most people have a, a, a dim view or they have this uh, negative uh, um, you know, perception of Esau. Esau. And it, it comes from Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. Look here in verse number, begin in verse number 15. So it says this, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. <clears throat> lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. <clears throat> sold his birthright, for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now what sticks out in our minds is there in verse number 16, where the Bible says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Now, in your mind, if you were to be honest, you know that you have this very negative view of Esau as a person. And I'm telling you that this right here is where that comes from. And I'll tell you how I know that is because this is really the only place that speaks negative of Esau, the person, at all, period, in the entire Bible. There may be maybe some other, like, 
uh, interpretations you may come away with, like what took place in a situation, like, hey, I may have not have done exactly what Esau did there. But otherwise, from this passage, I can't think of anything that talks about Esau as a bad person. And not only that, Esau, outside of this, and then maybe when he hates his brother in his heart, seems to be a very good guy. He's very forgiving. He has great grace with Jacob. He ends up, like we saw there a moment ago, whatever the purpose or reason, there's this conflict that's going on between their cattle and Esau ends up being, say, being the one and saying, hey, I'll pack up my things and go. When we look at Esau as a person, Esau seems to be a pretty good guy. He was there when his father died. He went with Jacob and helped bury his father. I mean, we could go on and on. If we observe their life, we look at the, the, the very little that is mentioned about Esau. Esau seems to be a good guy. But of course, he made a terrible, horrible mistake. And, uh, you know, I, I've preached on this exact point a couple of times in the book of Genesis just because it was very relevant to the text. But it's also relevant now. Uh, this proves that sometimes uh, you can become known by the bad that you do in your life. You may do a lot of good things, but if you make a major mistake, that is probably what people are going to remember you by. It's going to be the major mistake that you've made. And that's why this sticks out so much in your mind when we think of Esau as a person. Uh, one of the other things I want to point out about this is I, th there's no reason to think that Esau was not saved. Uh, this has nothing to do with his personal salvation. This was the blessing as we know from uh, Galatians 3.16 that was given to that specific person like a uh, or Abraham, that specific person Abraham, and then to his seed which was Christ. Now, this was handed down from person to person, uh, as in through that genealogy or through that stream it was given and it was, it was going through that. Basically, you ended up being, what you got from all of this was a temporal blessing upon your life when we study this out. And then also you got to be in the genealogy of the Messiah where you got to be a progenitor of the Christ who would come one day. It had nothing to do with personal salvation. It didn't have anything to do with personal salvation at all. So it would, if for us to say, hey, Esau was saved or Esau was, was not saved, you would have zero basis for that. You would have no basis either way really to say whether he was or wasn't. If you were to speculate, it would make the most sense to say that he was, I believe, because he was a, a child of Abraham. And uh, Abraham, I believe, raised his children faithfully. It seems to be that way. With uh, He's a child, of course, of Isaac. But Abraham, Isaac, of that family, they seem to raise their children faithfully. They seem to be godly people. Uh, I would, of course, assume, it would be safe to assume, that he taught uh, his children of the Word of God. God and of the gospel. So that would be the safest assumption to me. But notice, this is actually written here in Hebrews 12, 15 to Christians. So you could be a profane person just like Esau, proving that this can apply to you as well. Because the book of Hebrews is written to Christians. And he says in verse 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So this is something that can come into a person's life after they've received the grace of God. They can fail in the Christian life. They can have something spring up and trouble them. And they can, have a, they can end uh, their Christian life in a negative way. Or they can have a major downfall in their Christian life. So to, to say, oh, I don't believe Esau is saved, that, there's no basis to that at all. That's not what this is teaching even slightly. But this is the reason why we have a negative outlook on uh, the person of Esau is because he did one very, very stupid thing. He was willing to sell his birthright for a bowl of chili, pretty much, as people will say. That's basically what he did. For, for immediate gratification, he sold his birthright. I mean, which is obviously ridiculous and it's very fleshly and worldly. And I think from comparing Scripture with Scripture and the way that uh, Hebrews 12 looks down upon Esau's uh, decision, he wasn't uh, dying. He wasn't starving to death, obviously, or the Holy Spirit would not be uh, you know, shaming him for what he did. He was obviously just hungry and he uh, you know, uh, did not... Uh, look at his birthright or esteem his birthright as being very important, obviously, is what took place. I want you to turn to uh, uh, Joshua 24.4. Joshua 24.4. <clears throat> Joshua 24.4. A lot of tonight is probably going to be, uh, it's going to be more laid back and it's going to be probably more review of things that you're familiar with already. Joshua 24.4. 
very likely going to be a shorter sermon as I, I believe I mentioned. Joshua 24, <clears throat> chapter 24, verse 4. I want you to notice this. Joshua 24, 4, it says this, And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. And then he says, And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Now this is speaking of God, of course. And God says that he specifically gave unto Esau... <clears throat> Mount Seir. That's where the, the Edomites, or those that were of the line of Esau, that's where they dwell. Now, he's giving this to Esau. So this at least shows some sort of favor that Esau has in God's eyes, in some way or another, because he's, he's giving this possession unto Esau. He's saying, hey, Israel, you are not allowed to have this. Jacob, you are not allowed to have this. Mount Seir, I have dedicated and allotted that particular area, that, that uh, land, to Esau. So this seems to uh, appear as if God does have some sort of favor towards Esau, wherein he, num number one, gives the land to him, and number two, he makes sure that Israel doesn't touch it, and he says, you're not allowed to have it. I'm making sure that they keep this, right? So that shows a little bit of favor towards the man Esau, uh, at least in some way or another. Also, I want you to turn with me to, uh, let's go to Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 23, verse number 7. We'll see also here, <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verse number 7. We'll see also here, uh, <clears throat> seems as if God looked uh, favorably towards Esau. <clears throat> it says in Deuteronomy chapter number 23, verse number 7. <clears throat> Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, and then it says this, for he is thy brother. So notice there he says, Thou shalt not abhor, that means hate. Thou shalt not abhor or hate an Edomite, and why? It says, for he is thy brother. He is thy brother. I'm not touching on it. Don't, don't I'm not even, I, I, I'm fed up to here with it. So notice how it seems as if he is, he is speaking favorably about Esau. So he allots the land. He says, hey, that's yours. Nobody's allowed to have it. And then not only that, he says, hey, don't hate the Edomite. Don't hate those of Esau, right? He says, this is, you know, he is your brother and you should, what is he telling him to do? He's telling him to love Esau. He's telling him to love uh, the Edomite, right? Now, of course, you know, uh, later on in history, God ends up saying that he hates Esau or he hates the Edomites at that time, right? And that was because they were very wicked. He actually talks about the wickedness in the land at that specific time. And so that makes perfect sense because the Bible tells us that God hates the wicked. He's angry with the wicked every day. So it doesn't matter whether you're uh, you know, physically an Israelite or whether you're physically an Edomite. If you are super wicked, if you're just an extremely wicked person, uh, you know, you just live a tremendously wicked life. God will hate you as well. There are people that God hates. You know, that's just bit Bible. I could show you, you know, around 20 verses where God says he hates these different people. You know, it, there's many, many verses. He says he abhors people. He hates people. You know, what he does is he hates the wicked. He doesn't just hate people, you know, uh, just based upon, you know, the country that they live in or based upon all of these things that they, they can't control or, you know, uh, who their father was. You know, the Bible doesn't teach something like that. that that's ridiculous. That's not the God of the Bible at all. Uh, he hated them because of the wickedness. It says in their borders, I believe, is the way that it's worded. So, uh, by default, they should, it, the Israelites should love the Edomite. They should love Esau. Once you go back, let's go back to Genesis chapter number 36 now. Genesis chapter number 36. So, when we look at the life of Esau, outside of his one major uh, mistake that he made, he seems to be a good guy. Esau seems to be a good guy. He seems to be respectable. He seems to be a man of integrity. He's, he's a man that is very forgiving. Uh, you can see he cares for his brother. He's very merciful and he was very hospitable. He wanted to give thanks to his brother. He wanted to help his brother. He wanted to live near his brother. Uh, he ended up, hey, being non-confrontational. If you think about this, the only other situation where we see almost this exactly, like in verse 7 where it says, for their riches were more than they, that, they would uh, that they could dwell together, and then one leaves, do you know where else that happens? With Abraham and Lot, almost identical takes place. You know what happened? Abraham was the one that took the high road there, wasn't he? Abraham was the one that, said, that stopped and said, hey, they're striving, we need to make sure that we resolve this because we don't want to fight because we're brethren, right? Well, you know who did that in this case? Esau did that. I'm not saying Jacob was to blame, but I'm saying we can at least see a lot of good qualities and good virtues uh, that 
Esau has in his life. He's there and Barrett helps bury uh, his father with his brother. Esau, outside of his major mistake, doesn't seem to be a horrible person at all. Uh, he was, of course, extremely angry with his brother, but you know what? David was a very bloody man. We can see this all throughout the Bible, people killing people. Uh, you know, this doesn't mean that he's, you know, of the devil or he's just this extremely wicked man. He was, pro he was a profane person and even the Hebrews were warned not to be a profane person or being a fornicator. It says a fornicator or a profane, a profane person, right? You could be a fornicator. Notice those things are coupled together. These are warnings all throughout the New Testament written to uh, the local body of Christ saying, hey, don't be a fornicator. So guess what? They're coupled together. Don't be a profane person. So just like how Esau was, you could be as well. There's no reason to think that he was unsaved. The safe assumption is, is most likely that he probably was uh, a saved uh, uh, believer. That's the safest assumption. Let's look there in verse number 8. It tells us, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Now, uh, we looked at the verse already in Joshua 24, 4, where God said that he, not for Israel not to touch Mount Seir because God gave Edom or Esau Mount Seir. He gave that to him and that Israel was not allowed to have any of that. Now, that could have taken place here. Because Jacob received the uh, blessing, uh, at this point, God may have put it into Esau's heart. I mean, that's possible. This is all speculation for him to leave. He may have came to him and told him to leave. Uh, or maybe when he arrived, God just had appointed this property. Hey, I'm going to make sure that Esau keeps this property. And then later on, told Israel, don't touch that property. Because he, at that point, was saying, I'm making sure that Edom or Esau keeps keeps this property. Either way, Esau left Canaan and he went to Mount Seir and God at some time or another ended up saying, I am giving this land to you Esau. I'm making sure that you keep this land and no one else is going to be able to take it from you. Uh, so we see that there in verse 8. I want you to flip over. Look at uh, verse 20 here in the same chapter. Look at verse number 20. We're told a little bit about that land. It says, these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land, Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Ana. So notice there it says, these are the sons of Seir, the Horite. It says, who inhabited the land. So these are the people that were living in the land previous to this, or maybe even uh, some of their descendants at this time. And that's why the land was named Seir eventually, uh, or, or uh, I'm sorry, ultimately. That's why the land was ultimately named Seir or Mount Seir. It's called Seir. Sometimes it's called Mount Seir because the property was upon a mountain. That's why. Go over to Genesis 14.6. Genesis chapter number 14, verse number 6. <clears throat> a little earlier on, you can see that, that uh, this group of people <clears throat> was actually <clears throat> excuse me, dwelling in this land uh, much earlier at the time of Abraham, uh, even before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. Look at verse number 6. It says, And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. So notice that the Horites were there even prior to Sodom and Gomorrah. So basically right there, to make sure that you understand uh, verse number 20, and that when we'll get down to this in a moment, I'll make sure that I point this out, the delineation. Verse number 20 there is not speaking specifically of the Edomites or of those of Esau. It's telling you who indwelled that land previously and why it's referred to as Mount Seir. They were actually there long before Esau even existed, long before uh, Esau was even there. It was the Horites, H-O-R-I-T-E-S. The Horites dwelled there previously, and it was named after a man, Seir, who was Seir the Horite. So that is the land that he's dwelling in, and this is just telling you about that land that he lived in and, and who it was that lived there. Look at... Um, Go back uh, over uh, or back a little bit where we were before. We're going to begin reading again in verse number 10. It says, These are the names of Esau's sons. Uh, Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Reuel, the son of Bashamath, uh, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman and Omar and Zepho and Gadam and Kenaz. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Now he's telling you, so uh, obviously if you're paying close attention, there it's speaking of each of the wives of Esau and which children they bear unto Esau. So keep reading there, verse 14. And these were the sons of Aholabama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. <clears throat> and she bare to Esau Jeush and Jaalim and Korah. 
These were, the, these were dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kenaz. Of course, duke is a position of leadership. It's of authority like, uh, similar unto a king. Look at verse 16. Duke Korah, Duke Gatim, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. <clears throat> and these are the sons of Reuel. Esau's son, Duke Nahath, Duke Zerah, Duke Shema, Duke Miza, these are the dukes that came of Reuel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Bashamath, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Aholabama, Esau's wife, Duke Jeush, Duke Jalem, Duke Korah. These were the dukes that came of Aholabama, the daughter of Ana, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these are their dukes. So I want to point out one more time uh, while we're reading there in verse number uh, 19. Notice again it says, these are the sons of Esau who is Edom. Now you may read over this, but it is important to understand that Edom was Esau's name. Again, I know I just pointed this out, but sometimes people don't get this. Edom was another name for Esau. Because it tells you plainly, these are the sons of Esau. So it's not talking about his sons. That's proven. It's the sons of Esau, right? So it says, these are the sons of Esau who is Edom. So it's not talking about his sons, it's talking about the person. So Edom is not exclusively a name for the nation. It is just another name of Esau. Esau had two names, right? Esau and Edom. Esau and Edom, it's exactly the same as Jacob and Israel. You could refer to the nation of Israel just as much as, uh, as Jacob as you can Israel. So that's important to understand. Sometimes people think that Edom just refers to the nation. No, either one does. Uh, you know, one may be used predominantly in a specific context. Yes. You know, Esau may be more of the name that we use when we speak of the person. <clears throat> But they are both just as much his personal names. And one of his personal names ended up being the predominant name that they referred to the nation by. That's what happened. So that's how this works. That's very important to understand. All throughout the Bible, it's very common that people have multiple names. Look at verse 20. These are the sons of Seir the Horite who inhabited the land. Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Ana. Notice this is a delineation now. This is not to do with... Esau or Edom at all. It picks right up right there. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, right? We saw that the Horite, they were dwelling in the land previous to this, and Seir is the, uh, the man that this land was named after. So he was living, you know, uh, most likely generations before this. Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Ana. Look at verse 21. And Dishan and Ezer and, D and Dishan, these are the dukes of the Horites, the children of Seir in the land of Edom. And the children of Lotan were Horai and Heman, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. <clears throat> and the children of Shobal were these, Alvin and Manahath, Manahath and Ebal and Shepho and Onam. And these are the children of Zibion, both Aja and Ana. This was that Ana that found the mules in the wilderness as he fed the asses of Zibion, his father. Those little shout outs are super cool. Like when there's just like these, basically like these just like uh, uh, isolated shout outs where you're not sure where this is located. It's not necessarily in the Bible, but you have like this little statement where God, the Holy Spirit's like, hey, make sure you mention that time. You know, maybe he was obedient to his father or whatever it may be, but he wants to make sure the Holy Spirit does that you mention this particular work or, or uh, uh, act that this man did. It's very interesting. Because uh, it seems, of course, out of, out of place and out of context, but of course we can learn from it. Verse 25, he was serving his father. That's why I mentioned that. It's most likely he was being obedient unto his father. Look at verse uh, 20, where are we at? 25 now. And the children of Ana were these, Dishan and Aholabama, the daughter of Ana. <clears throat> and these are the children of Dishan, uh, Hemdan and Ishban, Eshban and Ithran and Cheran. The children of Ezer are these, Bilhan and and Zeavan and Achan, the children of Dishan, are these, Uz and Aran. These are the dukes that came of the Horites, Duke Lotan, Duke Shobal, Duke Zibion, Duke Ana, Duke Dishan, Duke Ezer, Duke Dishan. These are the dukes that came of Horai, among their dukes in the land of Seir. Now I want you to notice too, it's interesting that it says these are the dukes that came of Horai. So that's not plural anymore, right? So Horai obviously was a, an ancestor to Seir. 
right? That's why Seir was a Horite, right? So uh, he was of the Horites, he's referred to as. So th there is actually a mention of another patriarch, because there's these different delineations with patriarchs, right? Because you can say Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, just like you can say David, just like you can say Shem, right? Uh, you know, people will say like a, a Semite. You know, so that's just a specific point of delineation in a genealogy. And then you, so you can do that point and use him as a patriarch, which is going to be a more vast genealogy. Or you can skip down a few generations and narrow it down more and say Abraham. He's a different patriarch at a different time period of, you know, of a more specific line or uh, tribe, if you will. Uh, and then, you know, of course, there's 12 tribes that come from him as well. Uh, look there in verse number 31. And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. And Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom. And the name of his city was Denhabah. And Bela died in Jobab, the son of Zerah of Bozra, or Bozra, reigned in his stead. And Jobab died, and Husham of the land of Temani reigned in his stead. And Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Avith. And Hadad died, and Samla, or Samla of Masrika reigned in his stead. And Samla died, and Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his stead. And Saul died, and Baalhanan the son of Akbor died in his, or I'm sorry, reigned in his stead. And Baalhanan the son of Akbor died, and Hadar reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Peu, and his wife's name was Mehatabel. Mehatabel. Uh, where I go? And the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Meza, Mezahab. Those words just got, those names just got a lot more difficult there all of a sudden. Brother Russell spends a few minutes reading that over there. I should have done that myself. Uh, where are we at here? Verse number 40. And these are the names of the dukes that came of Esau according to their families after their places <coughs> by their names. Duke Timnah, Duke Alva, Duke Je Jetheth. Uh, Duke Ahalabama, Duke Elah, Duke Pinon, Duke Kenaz, Duke Teman, Duke Mibzar, Duke Magdiel, Duke Iram. These be the dukes of Edom according to their habitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau. Now watch this. The father of the Edomites. Notice now how it's used as a name to refer to the entire nation, right? To refer to this tribe or this nation, if you will. Now, <clears throat> one thing that I want to point out to you, we're going to see this name used uh, uh, earlier on as well. And this is going to play into this. And, and I really should have went through here and found how many times this happened. Because I, I think I read over, I did. Uh, uh, so let's look at it. I just found it just glancing around. Look at verse number 41. It says, Duke Ahalabama. Now, is that a woman or a man? That's a man, right? Duke of Alabama, right? Well, we saw that name earlier, and that's going to be relevant here in just a minute. Look at verse 25. It says, And the children of Ana were these, Dishon and Ahalabama, the daughter of Anan. So, there we see Ahalabama mentioned again. This time, this is referring to a woman. This is not referring to a man. So, I want you to notice there that this name is used about a man, but it is also used about a woman. And I was mentioning uh, a moment ago <clears throat> about I was going to go over some of the apparent discrepancies. I'll get that in just a moment. There are a couple of things I want to look at first. Let's go to Psalm chapter number 12, verse number 6. Very familiar verse with everyone here. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 12, verse number 6. In just a moment, we're going to back up in the, our chapter there and look at verses, uh, I believe it's 2 and 3. We're going to look at this supposed discrepancy. Our starting point is that the Word of God is perfect and pure and there's no errors. I believe that by faith. I believe that by faith when I first sat down and read the Bible as a Christian, as a saved, born-again believer, I believed that this book was perfect. I believe that this was the Word of God. Amen. I believe that this was the Word of God. I really and truly did. Um, <clears throat> As reading, you know, after reading the Bible many times, you know, right around 26, 27 times through right now, I will tell you this, that I am even more convinced today that this is the Word of God. The more times I spend reading the Bible and the more times I spend studying the Bible, I, the more convinced I become that this is the Word of God. Uh, the Bible is powerful. It, it has more power than any piece of literature that has ever been written. This book has so much authority. That's why all these cults, when they hear it, they love to get a hold of it. 
because it has great authority. It has great strength. There's a lot of power in the Word of God. If you were to speak to any person that is a uh, uh, you know that studies literature, right? That that is their background in in in, in almost any um, uh, field uh, that would be related to literature. It is so widely accepted that the King James Bible in particular is the greatest piece of literature that has ever been written. That exists on this planet. I mean, that I'm not just blowing smoke up here. That is accepted across the board. Richard Dawkins, the, the biggest God-hater that walks this earth, said that the King James Bible is the greatest piece of literature. But then out of the other side of his mouth, he talks about how a bunch of goat herders and he just hates the God of the Bible, of course, right? So he, he tries to make it sound like it's uneducated and ignorant and things like that. But then he talks about the greatness of this book. You know, this book is amazing. And I'll tell you, I want to say this before we get into this, you know, apparent. And, and apparent, the word apparent comes from like appearance, Right? It's how something appears, apparent. An apparent contradiction is something that appears that it's a contradiction, right? So this is something that looks like it contradicts, but of course it does not because the Bible is perfect and it is pure. The, one of the major things that stuck out to me and continues to just blow my mind when studying the Bible is the, the, the amazing consistency of the Bible. I mean, the amazing consistency of the Bible in so many different ways. The historical references, the time periods, I mean, there are so, the quotations, the doctrine of just multiple authors. Do you know how many authors there were of the Bible? Of, you know, you have 66 books, and then the, the amount of authors are debated around tw uh, high 20s into 30s. There are so many different authors. Who, who lived over a, a period of like 1,500 years. And the doctrine is so consistent. Amen. It is just so consistent of what you have to do, you know, to be saved. You even have, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the amazing concept. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but when we look at the consistency of the Old Testament and going into the New Testament from a, histor a historical sp uh, perspective, excuse me, from an historical perspective, we know all throughout the Old Testament that the Jews were extremely disobedient. God calls them a disobedient and gainsaying people. They were extremely disobedient. But God still used those scribes to transcribe. And they even would admit this today, of course. Even the Jews of today that would, that would live and subscribe to Judaism. And even they admitted it at the time of Christ, that they were disobedient and things. They, the scribes and uh, the Levites were the ones that were used to preserve God's word, even though it was very negative towards that group of people. You know, it, it's, it's a very interesting concept. And then when Jesus Christ shows up, they're still extremely against, you know, uh, uh, the God of the Bible, really. They have their own religion and everything. So <clears throat> to see the consistency and the preservation all throughout the Old Testament... And, and all of the quotations that are just amazingly uh, you know, uh, quoted in the New Testament and how you can learn things from them. The depth of, the depth of God's Word. You know, it's just, you could go on and on and on. How you can read the book of Ecclesiastes, you can read the book of Isaiah, you know, 15 times and there's a, sing, there's a chapter in there that you only understand a few things in still. And you read it another five times and you've learned more within that chapter. You know, and people say, oh, they were just foolish, ignorant goat herders back then. It's like, then why in the world, Richard Dawkins, do you not understand anything that the Bible says? I mean, give him a, a complex chapter in the book of Ecclesiastes and say, hey, I want you to, you know, crack, the, I want you to explain to me this proverb. He wouldn't have a clue. Of course, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit inside of him. But it, there's just so much depth in the Word of God. You could look at the Word of God from so many different angles. It is amazing. The Bible, the King James Bible, is so amazing. And the most amazing thing about it is the consistency of the Word of God. It is the great and amazing consistency of the Word of God. How it always agrees with itself all the time. It's so amazing. So we're going to look at here in just a moment what appears to be a contradiction, which of course is not. And I'm going to, I'm going to explain to you uh, a few different uh, ways to explain this particular uh, you know, apparent discrepancy, right? So here in Psalm chapter number 12, verse number 6, the Bible says this, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver 
tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So notice there are a couple of things. Number one, uh, the, the words of God are referred to as pure words. That means that it's perfect. It's pure. It has no blemish in it. It's pure. that All the dross is taken out. It talks about it as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Saying all the problems and all the blemishes, it's all gone. It's, it's pure. It's perfect. There's no errors. That means there's no contradictions. It's all correct. It's all truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. I believe that this is the word of God. Flip over with me to Proverbs chapter number 30. We're just going to look at a few verses here that tell us the, the uh, speak of the perfection of God's Word. Speak of the purity of God's Word. Look at Proverbs chapter number 30, verse number 5. We'll see this again. <clears throat> Notice this. It says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. So notice what it says. Every word of God is pure. So it's not just some of the words. It's not just all oh, the Word of God in general. People try to say that. Well, the NIV is the Word of God. The King James Bible is the Word of God. Even though they all say different things. No, no, no. It's, you know what the Word of God is? It's speaking of... The Word of God will be used, but it's speaking of the perfect, pure Word of God. And they all can't be the Word of God if they all contradict. It's not possible. And within the Word of God, it tells you every Word of God is pure. Every Word. So I believe that we have every word today. We saw the preservation there. I forgot to point that out in Psalm 12, 7, the very next verse. He spoke of how, he says, Thou shalt uh, keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Jesus spoke about how, he said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall, shall not pass away. Right? So the word of God will never pass away. The word of God is pure. Every word, like this says, every word of God is pure. Every word. So there are no contradictions in the word of God. It is pure. It is perfect. This is exactly what God spoke. Exactly. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter number 4, He said, man shall not live, verse number 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. And you know what? Every word is pure. That's our starting point. I believe the Word of God. And if I feel like, let me say this too. Go to Genesis uh, uh, 36. If I feel like something contradicts, then I'm the problem. I'm the problem. I need to be smarter. I need to study the Word of God more. I need to, you know, uh, to uh, uh, study the Word of God more and, and, and show myself approved as a student of the Word of God. If I feel like something contradicts, then I'm the one that's wrong and the Word of God is right and it is correct. Because it is always pure and it is always correct and it is always perfect. So here in Genesis chapter number 36, uh, you might want to take your bulletin. If you've got a couple of pieces of paper, that would be even better. Uh, but Genesis chapter number 36, there verse number 2 and 3. We're going to read those again right now because this is our text, of course. Then we're going to go to two other chapters where the wives of Esau are mentioned. Two other chapters in the book of Genesis. So here in Genesis 36 verse 2 it says, Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholabama the daughter of Ana the daughter of Zibion the Hivite. Verse 3, And Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajah. So that was the other wife uh, that he had taken, of course, that was not of Canaan, that was not of uh, the land of Canaan or the daughters of Canaan. So go ahead and slide something in there. We'll come back to that in just a moment. We're going to go all the way uh, to the first mention of his wives, of when he took his wives. Genesis 26, 34. Genesis chapter number 26, verse number 34. Then we'll work our way back to where we were uh, previously. Genesis chapter number 26, verse number 34. It says this, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And then it says, Which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. So I want you to pay close attention to the names that are mentioned right now. Again, verse number 34, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, so it says, Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. So both of them are mentioned as being a Hittite as far as the fathers. Uh, one name of the father is Beri, the other name is Elon. So Judith is the daughter of Beri the Hittite. And also there's Bashamath, who's the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Go now to Genesis 28. 
Genesis chapter number 28, look at uh, verse number 8 also. <clears throat> We're going to look at verse 8 and 9. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, so that of course seems to refer back to Genesis 26, verse 34, what we just read. Genesis 28, 9. Then went Esau unto Ishmael, and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. So right now we have, just with these two texts, we have three wives that Esau has taken unto himself, correct? There are three wives that Esau has taken unto himself. Now this is where the confusion comes in. Genesis chapter number 36, verse number 2. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholabamah, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. <clears throat> now verse 3. And Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajah. So we have three wives that are mentioned here. But the names are not the same. Not only are the names not the same, even a father's name is different and his, uh, his native land is different, right? So if we compare verse 2 back to verse 26 and verse 34, it tells us again, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite. Well, if you look at verse 2, uh, uh, Beri the Hittite is not mentioned. If we look back again at verse uh, 34, it says, And Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Okay? Well, Elon is mentioned there. And uh, it's Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Over here, it was Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. So there you can see where someone we could say, Hey, this is a discrepancy. Or, you know, someone that doesn't believe the Word of God, they'd say, Hey, the Bible has a contradiction, right? Not only that, if you compare uh, Genesis 36 verse 3 to Genesis 28, uh, verse number 9. Let me flip back over there to Genesis 28. So I'll read to you Genesis 36, 3. It says, And Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. Okay, verse number uh, 9 in Genesis 28, 9 says, Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. Okay, so I'm going to be using an illustration here in just a moment. I do want to talk about a couple of things first before I get into that. Number one, I spoke about having faith in, uh, you know, the Word of God, right? Having faith in the Word of God. That is where it begins, right? That is where it begins. Number one, number two, I want to talk about a, uh, a contradiction. Now, a contradiction, something that has to be that is proven to be a contradiction, uh, you know, has to be it has to be proven without any shadow of a doubt that that these both of these things cannot be true, right? So, in order to prove a contradiction, what you have to do is you have to show that Genesis chapter number twenty six, uh, you know, is, is true. Or, you know, you could, if you tried to demonstrate that none of them were from, you know, a God-hater's perspective. But that's not my point right now. What you would have to do is you'd have to show of Genesis 26, Genesis 28, and, and Genesis 36 that all three of them are not possible to be correct all at the same time. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Now, so in order to prove a contradiction, in order for somebody to say, hey, case closed, the Bible's not true, you would have to show text. Uh, you know, uh, three texts, two texts, whatever it is, just in general, con a contradiction, to prove a contradiction, you would have to show texts that conflict to the point where it is not possible that they can all be true at the same time. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Now, that's the only way that you can prove a contradiction. That, that to prove, absolutely prove a contradiction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show for you a, a few... Now, do I know... 100% the, the, the uh, possible answers that I'm presenting to you tonight are correct. 1 million percent? No, I don't know that. But I'm going to show you ways in which these things cannot be contradictions. Did everyone catch the statement that I just made? I'm going to show you ways to where you can uh, assemble the names and everything using, using principles from the Bible. 
Okay, I, I want that to be important to you as well. Using principles from the Bible, I'm going to show you how these names can be moved around and applied in certain ways when we use the, the uh, interpretation and the methods of interpreting the Bible to where we can say, hey, if this is true, this is not a contradiction. So I'm going to show you that this doesn't even come close to proving a contradiction in the Bible. Not even close. Okay, so I'm going to need, you know, I, I forgot to look for the push pins. So I'm going to need uh, someone, it doesn't matter who it is, I'm going to need someone to hold, you know, my uh, illustrations here. Okay, <clears throat> so these were made up at about 640. So nobody critique my format or anything, all right? So I use the same book for all of these, yes, that's what I did. So, all right, so this is, and I started off referring to it, both would be correct, but I changed it. I was going to call it the six wife model, but I refer to it as the six wives model. So this is one way in which you can, you can uh, say that, this, that there is not a contradiction with all of the three texts all at the same time. And I'll explain to you why these are, um, why these are, are possible, right? Why these are possible, and then I'm going to show you the other model. There actually could be three models. Which I don't, seem, I don't seem to think that it's probable, to be honest. I, I think that one of these two uh, options are, were, are, are uh, most likely the correct option. Uh, so this is the six wives model. Now, of course, we have Esau here, and what we have down here are the six wives. I tried to write it uh, you know, uh, with all caps so that it would be more... Uh, uh, you know, legible from your seat, so it would be more uh, readable from your seat. So, what we have here, so go to Genesis 26. Go to Genesis chapter number 26 and you can follow along. Genesis chapter number 26, verse number 34, we have two daughters uh, of the Canaanites, right? Two daughters of the Canaanites. It tells us, and Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite. Okay? So this would be one wife. Judith uh, the daughter of, so Judith of Beri, and he's a Hittite, right? He's of Canaan. So that would be one daughter. And then also it says, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. So we have Bashamath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Here are our scripture references down here, Genesis 26, 34. Now go to Genesis 28. Go to Genesis 28. Look at verse number 8. <clears throat> now, I don't believe that this model is the correct model either. I'm going to show you the one that I believe is, is more likely based upon interpreting it from Scripture. That's why I think that it's more, it's more uh, um, probable to be the correct uh, interpretation. So, Genesis 28, um, verse number 9 tells us, Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, so he already had wives, of course we read about them in Genesis 26, 34, verse 9, keep reading, which he had Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, <clears throat> the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. So here we have Mahalath of Ishmael, right? Genesis 28, 8 and 9. Now go over to Genesis 36. Genesis 36, verse number 2. Esau, <coughs> excuse me, took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. So now you would have another wife that he would, that he would have, right? Ada of Elon the Hittite, right? Now, of course, someone would say, well, I think that this is a mistake because this is Beri the Hittite and Elon the Hittite's right here as well. Well, I'll tell you a possibility to explain that if this is the correct model. These could be sisters, Bashamath and Ada. And you say, well, that's crazy. Oh, really? What about Jacob? There's an example right there where someone married sisters. It was very often that people married multiple wives at that time, and it was often that they would marry sisters. That, that happens. We have examples of that in the Bible. So we have, we have an example of that happening in the Bible. So is this a possibility? Is it possible? It is possible, isn't it, right? Now, you may not think that that's likely, and I don't believe this to be the correct model, but is, this is my point. Oh, Bible rejecter, is this possible? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. It is possible. <clears throat> so you'd have to prove that, that uh, Elon had no other daughters and that he never married, you know, and that there, there, there wasn't two people. That's, that's what you would have to, and you would never be able to do that, of course. So th is this possible? Yes, it is. Okay, and then we have... Um, Genesis, look at Genesis 36 again. 
Genesis 36, it says, so Esau, we'll read one more time. Esau took his wives, the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholabama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. So we have that also here. Aholabama of Ana, and it says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Aholabama, I think I wrote this down wrong. Aholabama of Ana, no, I have it correct. Okay, of Ana, uh, and it says, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. Okay, that was my mistake. I misread that just now. So he's Ana of Zibion, the Hivite, or Hivite, I'm sorry. So this seems to be standalone, even when you read the text, doesn't it? It's a Hivite, it's not even a Hittite. So somebody, well, they say, oh, you know, well, this is supposed to be this. There's no similarities at all, period. There's no similarities. How, how, you know, I don't even know how you can even conjure that up logically if you just think that it was a text written by man. How ever, all three of the names are wrong. And it even gives you a further back genealogy where it tells you the next person's name. Going back further, Zibion. None of those names are mentioned over there. Not, you know, they're not, none of those are mentioned at all. So, <clears throat> then we have here, uh, again, in Genesis 36, in, in verse number 3, we have, And Bashamath, or Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. So, Again, what you could do here is, if you wanted to make this as a separate person, this could still be another... I'm saying this is possible, right? This is not... I don't subscribe to this model, but I'm, pro, I'm showing you that you can't prove this is a contradiction. Right here, Bashamath. Is it possible that Bashamath was the sister of Mahalath? Is it possible? Is it possible? It, of course, is possible. It is possible that Bashamath is the sister of Mahalath, which would make, you know, Ishmael. And he could have married sisters again. Maybe because he married sisters once. He's like, hey, I like that. I'm going to marry sisters again. What we have to realize is this is the real world. Does everyone understand what I'm saying by that? So, you know... Things are not like when you... So when someone writes a novel, sometimes we want the Bible to be like a novel where, where somebody writes down and they make up a story. When you make up a story, you know, uh, you can make it extremely clean and clear and, and you can go back and check it and things like that, but life isn't like that, right? A, a way in which they bust people on the stand when someone will come up, a way in which they'll, they'll say that, that uh, uh, private investigators or people that are interrogating people and they're giving their you know, their uh, record of what happened in a particular uh, situation, a way in which they'll bust people is if their story's too perfect. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Like, if it sounds too perfect, that's one of their methods of busting people, right? Because, you know why? Because they study this, they study people's lives and how things happen in people's lives for a living, and they realize nothing is straight cut in the world. You know, people make decisions, everything's haywire, right? That's just how we are as human beings, right? So is this a possible model? Is it possible that this is a model that, that it, it, you know, is it, that, can you prove that these contradict? No, you can't. You can just say all of them are all separate people. That's possible. But the, I don't believe that this is correct. There's two other possibilities. Now this is the one that I say is most probable. And yes, I changed this as well after the fact, right? It was going to be the four wife model and I changed it to the four wives model. I almost regretted that afterwards, not only because of this. Can everybody read this? Is this, is this, can you read it back there? Probably not in the, I didn't think so, okay. Well, you can, I'll, I'll put these on display afterwards if anyone likes to come up. So, of course, we have Esau again, and then his wives are mentioned. Now, let's walk through the text one more time. Go back to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter number 26. Now, this is, I, I, I tried to exhaust the options, and these, I believe, are your only options. The, and this I believe to be the most probable. This is probably the case. So, <coughs> Genesis 26-34, we have one that's standalone, that's never really referred to by any other name. There's really no uh, uh, discrepancy with this particular one ever. So Genesis 26, 34, uh, seemingly of course, it says, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite. So that's very clear that he took a wife... Uh, named Judith of Beri the Hittite, right? It's very clear, okay? So we have that here, Genesis 26, 34, okay? Now also, we're going to go step by step, so we'll flip back and forth a few times. Also in Genesis 26, 34, look again, it says, And Bashamath, the daughter of Elon, 
the Hittite. So Elon the Hittite, he took the wife Bashamath, okay? Well, if we compare, go back over to Genesis uh, 36. Go over to Genesis 36. So this is what I believe to be uh, the answer here in Genesis 36. If you look at verse number 2, it says, Esau took his wives, the daughters of Canaan. It says, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. So there we see Elon being mentioned, the Hittite, right? But notice now she's referred to as Ada. Well, her name before was called Bashamath. If you don't know that people are referred to by multiple names in the Bible, number one, you weren't listening to the sermon that I've been preaching because I pointed out a few times. This is so common in the Bible. It's, it, it's, it's, see, I wouldn't even, this isn't even, this is far from a stretch. It's rare that a person has one name in the Bible. It's extremely rare. The Bible will call sometimes people by three or four different names. I mean, you have just, just amongst the disciples, this is all off the top of my head, you have uh, uh, Peter, right? You have Peter, Cephas, Simon. He has three names, and he's called by all three of them at different times, isn't he? All, he's, he's referred to by all these different names. Um, go to Exodus. Go to Exodus. I'll give you another example. <clears throat> these are very close to one another. That's why I want to give you this other example. Look at Exodus. I hope you didn't work hard today. Now you've got to stand up here. Exodus chapter number 2. Look at... Uh, okay, I've got to find this. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 16. Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Okay? Verse 17. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when there came to Ruel their father... So notice Ruel, their father. So this, he's the priest of Midian, right? This is, and of course he ends up marrying them, right? Skip down, uh, he ends up marrying Zipporah, is who her, uh, his daughter is, uh, Ruel. Look at, verse, look at uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Do you notice that? One more time, Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. And then it says this, the priest of Midian. Notice that. Just within a few verses, it just uses them interchangeable. This is just an example. There are so many times people have multiple names. The kings are called by multiple names all the time. Joshua has like four names in the Old Testament. You have, reading throughout the book of Jeremiah, you have Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar. They go back and forth. It's not even Nebuchadnezzar all throughout one place and then Nebuchadnezzar all throughout the other place. It goes back and forth. Nebuchadnezzar, ne Nebuchadnezzar, 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 Nebuchadnezzar. All the time in the Bible, I mean, let, let me tell you this. Like I said before, if you don't have two names, that's, that's rare. That's, you're the oddball. Sometimes people have three and four names. People have multiple names in the Bible. So this is extremely common. Extremely common. Super common. Okay, so that makes perfect sense. And the father is the same father, right? Elon the Hittite, there's consistency with the father's name. The only thing that we see a difference of is there's a different name that's used, right? And a lot of times in the Bible, uh, people will name people by their family. Like if there's someone else in the family. Now, if, if you notice, he married of the children of Canaan. Over and over and over again, we see the name Ada, Ana, Ada, Ana, and it's talking about different people. Over and over and over again. When John the Baptist was born, do you remember what his father said? Do you remember what they said to him uh, when he was getting ready to name his son? I can't remember what, they, what he was going to name him. They were going to name him something else, and then he ended up saying, no, his name's going to be John. And they were like, but nobody in thy family, none of thy kindred's name is John. Because So it's, it's very weird to name them a name that none of thy kindred had. My point is this. They all keep the same names. And they just keep recycling the same names over and over and over and over and over again. When you look at, um, um, <clears throat> where's that at? John 19. Go to John 19. I'll give you another example of this. John chapter number 19. When you look at the women that were following Christ, look at verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. What's his mother's name? Mary. Okay, look at the next part of it. And his mother's sister, Mary the, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. So you notice what all of their names are? Mary. Mary. Now, you may think that's weird today, but that's because this is a different culture. If these don't seem right to you, that's because we don't do this today. You, I call him Russell. I don't call him by some other name, too. 
Other cultures do that. You're not used to that, but the Bible, they do it all the time. Hey, Simon. Hey, Peter. Hey, Cephas. You know, maybe uh, 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 depending upon the context, and it could have something to do with the genealogy that's being mentioned now, maybe this is more of a form formal name, Ada, right? And this is maybe a name, and I'm going to get to this, maybe uh, Bashamath, <coughs> excuse me, this may be a name that's, that's given from some other angle. I don't know. You know, the, you know, there's other... I'm just kind of throwing out possibilities. I obviously don't know any of this. But the, you, know, you have no idea why the, the names can switch back and forth. No clue why, right? Um, but here we see Mary being given to all of them. And if you read this the way... You know, th there's two possible readings of verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, whose name is Mary. And you could say, and his mother's sister. And then if you said, Mary the wife of Cleopas... So if, if his mother, you know, I don't interpret it this way, but if, you know, uh, the wife of Cleopas is Mary's sister as well, then you have two brothers and sisters being named Mary. People do that. Sometimes, the, I know a guy in Tempe who named, what is it, seven kids? Chris. Right? Was it seven? Seven or six? All of them are named Chris. Do you know why that's weird to you, all American? But they do that in other countries because, you know, Hispanics will do that. Well, they'll name their kids the same name. And they'll have another name that they refer to them by. You know, do you think he says, Chris, Chris, come here, Chris, come here, Chris, come here. No, he has another name that he refers to each child by. Chris something or Chris something this or Chris something that. So you know what they, he does? They all have the same name, well, you know, one particular name, but then they all have a second name that he calls them by. See, do you understand how? You may not be familiar with this, but that's because we have a different culture today. So this is a uh, this I believe is the the what makes the most sense. This is the most probable answer. Elon the Hittite. We see the consistency of who this is, right? Okay. Now let's look at Genesis twenty-eight. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number twenty-eight. Genesis chapter number twenty-eight. This is where we see Ishmael's daughter being mentioned. Ishmael's daughter. Genesis chapter number twenty-eight. <clears throat> Verse number nine. Genesis 28, 9. It says, Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Maalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. So here we see he took unto him Maalath, right, of Ishmael, right? Now, let's look at the other text, um, Genesis 36. So compare, we're going to compare this, where she's mentioned again, I believe it to be the same person. Genesis 36, <coughs> verse 2. <clears throat> Look at, I'm sorry, verse 3. And it says, And Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. So here, this is obviously the same person. This is extremely consistent. It's number one, it's Ishmael's daughter. Number two, it's, you know, it's the same even title, sister of Nebajoth, right? Before she was called Mahalath. Now she's called Bashamath, right? I believe this clearly to be the same person with just a different name. Most people in the Bibles, Bible have multiple names. Now I'll give you my, th that other one I just came up you know, with on a whim a moment ago about maybe this is a more formal name and that's why it was given that, but that wouldn't make sense because now she's referred to as a, as a Bashamath, right? Or you could say that, you know, that j it doesn't matter the name. The name is not necessarily what's, what's formal. It could be maybe your primary name and maybe they want it in a, gene in a genealogy he wants to make sure that he uses the primary name that this person goes by, right? This could be a nickname. Uh, you know, uh, Bashamath could be a nickname of Elon. Uh, or vice versa. You have no idea, right? We're, we're not sure about this. This is obviously the same person here. It's, she's of the daughter, she's of Ishmael, and she's, and Ishmael, the sister of Nebajoth. Now, I'll tell you another possibility. I'm just throwing things out there. It's possible because people are given names by people. It's possible that, that Esau, when he took this wife on later, he gave her maybe that name Bashamath. That's possible. Maybe that's where this consistency comes from. Maybe her name was originally Mahalath. And then you have Bashamath. This is the real world. Maybe this woman passed away. Maybe she died. That's possible, right? And he wanted to call her by Bashamath now because he loved her. I'm just giving you scenarios. That's why I'm saying this is, this is real life, right? When you have a genealogy, life is messy, things change, you have multiple, you know, he has multiple wives, people have multiple names. This is just how the Bible works out. 
Genesis 36, also, and we have uh, verse number 2. Here's the next one. And it says, uh, uh, we'll read the whole thing again just so you don't miss it while we read it. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. We covered that one. And then we have this one, and Aholabama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. I believe this also to be a standalone, uh, standalone wife that he took on in addition to these women. We're never given the total amount of wives that Esau uh, had. You're never told that. You're never told one time how many wives he had in total. So, this makes perfect sense. I believe this is the most probable. I realize this might have fried your brain, you know, comparing all of these back and forth. But, this right here, this is, let me say this. This is uh, possible. This is possible to be true. Therefore, you have not proved a contradiction in the Bible. Do you understand that? So then we can step away from the defense and we start looking at this. And this makes perfect sense when we use the Bible as our tool of interpretation. People always have multiple names in the Bible. We can compare and see, hey, this is Biri the Hittite, right? Elon uh, also is referred to as the Hittite in both passages. Uh, and then we just see just her name different, right? Bashamath or Ada. We see people's names being changed just in a matter of five verses where it's like, hey, the priest of Midian, real. You know, hey, the priest of Midian, Jethro. Within five verses and it doesn't tell you, it doesn't explain it to you. You know, maybe a few, ver maybe it was like seven or eight verses. It does this all the time. This is not far-fetched. I, I want you to understand that this is not a stretch at all. This actually lines up perfectly with a, with, this is a, 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 a very good possibility. Now, you know what else you could do, which I don't believe this to be true. If you wanted to have a three wives model, you could do that. And you could make this person and this person the same person. That's your other possibility. You could do that. You could make th them two the same person, which I don't think, I think that doesn't make any sense at all. That makes no sense at all because we're given great detail uh, about the fathers. Biri is a Hittite. It's Ana of Zibion. Is that right? Zibion, and he's called a Hivite. So his nationality is different, number one. He's not even from, uh, you know, uh, he's not even a Hittite, right? And uh, we're given more information about him, and not only that, the father's name is different. So, I don't believe that that makes any, that, that doesn't seem probable to me at all. These seem very, very probable. Now, what, and, and like I said, <clears throat> all of his wives didn't live to be the same age. So, one wife could be dying, another wife, you know, he obviously had three all at the same time because it tells you in Genesis 28 that he had already married two wives of the Hittites, right? And then he took on the third wife then. Well, what may have happened was maybe this wife died and he took on another wife. That's possible. You know? He may not have had, maybe he felt lonely he had to have those three wives at the house, right? I have no idea. This is, you know, the, this right here demonstrates to you, and these are your possibilities. You have the three, the four, and the six. And you could try to make out a five one if you want, but it's, it's, it, I've looked at it, it doesn't look... It doesn't look like it makes any sense. It's, it's, it's not probable. I believe this to be by far the most probable example. Um, when I look at these uh, differences in names, it's, it's actually commonplace with the Bible. So don't let that bother you. That is commonplace. It happens over and over and over again. The Bible does it in a matter of, matter of verses. I find it to be amazing that this all takes place in the book of Genesis alone. Just in a few chapters, we're told this information. You know, so it's all right there. It's not like, oh, the book of Genesis and then uh, a thousand years later another book is written. No, this is written by the same person, right? You understand what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> uh, we have in the book of Genesis in 26, 28, and then 36, 36, and we have great consistency with the father's names. Notice the father's names stay the same and their nationality stay the same. You know, so we see, again, great consistency. We just see different names used. So, this is the way in which, so, are these models possible? Mm -hmm. They are, aren't they? They are possible. So, has someone proved a contradiction? They have not. I believe that this actually makes a lot of sense when looking at the Bible. All of these are methods of interpretation that the Bible itself uses, and it puts those tools in there so you know how to interpret the Bible. All people have different names. Even sisters, possibly, Mary and Mary. Which we see people doing that in culture. Now, you may not be familiar with that in our culture, but 
That happens in the Bible's culture. Two kings are reigning at the same time with the same name. Their name will just... Uh, there's many times in the Bible, I can't remember which particular king it is, where it'll state his name, and then just like a couple of verses later, it'll be talking about the same guy, and it'll state his name again, and it's totally different. And then it'll, you know, two, two verses later, it'll state his name again, and it's totally different again. It happens all the time. All the time in the Bible. So don't let this bother you. Don't let this bother you. You know, the Word of God is true. The Word of God is true. You know, what God does, I strongly believe this, is God puts... Go to... Go to uh, let's do this real quick. We'll end with this. Go to Matthew 27. God puts stumbling blocks in the Bible for the, for the unbeliever, for the infidel. He puts stumbling blocks. Everybody's thinking, you said this was going to be a short sermon. Shut up and learn something, right? Go to Matthew 27. <clears throat> God puts stumbling blocks in the Bible, but when you compare things, you know what you do is you learn something every time. You learn something. <clears throat> to those that have faith in the Word of God, they study the Word of God out, it makes perfect sense, and it strengthens your faith in the Word of God. Look at Matthew chapter 27, verse number 37. It says this, <clears throat> And set up over his head his accusation written. It says this, This is Jesus the King of the Jews. Notice, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Go to Mark 15. Mark 15. We're going to end on this. Mark 15. I want you to look at verse 26. And the superscription of his accusation was written, the King of the Jews. Are those exactly the same? They're not exactly the same, are they? But let me ask you this question. Can both be true? Notice there's only one portion that's left out purposely. The other one said, this is Jesus, and then it said what this says, the King of the Jews. So this is exactly what Matthew 27 said, but just a little portion left out. Now, the, the purpose for that is, the different Gospels, we have four, gospel, four stories of Jesus' life, four Gospels, because we learn different things from each of them, and they all have different themes, right? They all have different themes, and they're, they're trying to get different truths apart. Uh, across, I'm sorry. They're trying to get different truths across to us. So what God will do is He will uh, tell you a story from a certain angle to get a specific truth apart. So there'll be a theme that carries all throughout. So right here, He just tells you a portion of what was written above His, his, uh, his cross because there's a certain theme that He wants to, to get across, right? But notice both are true. Now, could you see how somebody could point out and say, hey, that's a contradiction. No, it's not. Both are true. This one just doesn't tell you all of it purposely. Go to Luke now. I want you to go to Luke. Go to Luke um, 23. Look at verse 38. And a superscription also was written over him in, in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. Now, if you would have noticed, the other one didn't tell you it was written in Greek and Latin and Hebrew. You notice that? The book of Luke is extremely uh, detailed. Luke was, uh, was very educated. Luke was a doctor. If you read the book of Luke, there are, uh, there are uh, uh, different names used for a lot of places. Like that's where you find uh, the difference between Calvary and Golgotha, right? You see different names, geographical names that are used for different places. There's a lot more detail about where do we find the Christmas story when it talks about how, they, how, how Joseph and Mary went to be taxed. Where do we find that at? The book of Luke. Why? Because there's historical details that are in the book of Luke. So that's one of the angles of the book of Luke is it's more detailed. It comes from more of a, an, uh, you know, an educated, uh, uh, detailed perspective. That's why he gives you that information there. Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. He gives you all three of the language. Notice what it says. This is the king of the Jews. <clears throat> now, does that contradict Mark 15? No. Mark 15 said the king of the Jews. <clears throat> does that contradict Matthew, 17, uh, Matthew 27? No, because it said, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Do you notice how they're all three true, but God chooses, hey, I want to word it this way this time. All three of them are true. All of these things were written above His cross. All of them. Now go to John. Go to the book of John. <clears throat> go to John 19. Look at verse 19. John 19, 19. <clears throat> John 19, 19. <clears throat> and Pilate wrote a title... And put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now I want you to notice how there's a little bit of a difference in each one. But when you put all the letters together, 
Do you know what you get? This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And if you lined all of those up next to each other, none of them... Now, I want you to catch this because you need to understand the actual meaning of contradict. None of them contradict. Not one of them. When you put them together, do you know what you get? You get the full picture. You get more information. And not one of them is worded in such a way where both, both uh, John 19 and then Matthew 27 can't be true. No, they both can be true. They're worded in such a way where both go together perfectly, grammatically. They make perfect sense and you're given more information. And the, I have my own explanations of why the differences are and how they fit with the theme. What's the theme of the book of John? He's God. So it makes perfect sense. Now, almost all throughout the Bible, it's, it's talking about him, how he's being God, how he's God, how he came from heaven, right? And he's not talked about as a man very much. Not talked about, he is a man, of course, he was fully man, right? When he's dying on the cross, you know what you see a lot of? His humanity. Right? And you know what it mentions? Hey, this is Jesus of Nazareth. Do you know what Nazareth is? It's a, specific, it's a city where a man was born. So it's, it's, it's balancing out the whole book of, of John, stressing and emphasizing the fact that, hey, this is God. This is God. And then you get here in John 19, you have this little bit of detail that the other ones don't give you. And it's Jesus of Nazareth. Because he is truly a man in the flesh and dying on that cross all at the same time. So you can have your own explanations of why. But the whole point is this. When you compare, isn't that amazing? I want you to think about this for a minute. When you compare all of these supposed contradiction and supposed discrepancies, this book was written by, by over 30, they say 29, like I said, to 32 authors, something like that. Or I'm sorry, 39 authors. It's 39. They say 39 authors is what people will believe. Some people say, you know, 40. Depends on your interpretation of who wrote Hebrews, right? So, 39, 40 authors. And there's not a single time in this huge book where, where 39 to 40 authors on like, what is it, three different continents, three different continents over a span of 1,500 years, you can't prove a contradiction in this entire book. That's amazing. Not only that, the greatest people, the, the, the smartest people in the world in the subject of literature, right? They look at this book and they say this is the greatest piece of literature that has ever been written. It's the most preserved book. We have more manuscripts of this book and the consistency of the manuscripts. Hey, there's a big deal because the Word of God is extremely important between, between the, um, the New Modern Bible versions and the King James Bible. That's a huge deal. But when you look at all the manuscripts, all of them, people that study manuscripts, they say that they are like 99.999% the same. That's even including the Alexandrian, all the Alexandrian texts. Alexandrius, Vaticanus, and Sinaiticus. Even including these texts that are vastly different, you throw those into the equation, it's still 99.999. There is no piece of literature that is preserved like that on this planet. There's nothing. And, and a God-hater can't even, they, can't, they could spend their entire life studying this book and they can't even find something and say, hey, I've proved without a shadow of a doubt that's contradiction. If someone, if you tried to compile a book and put men together writing a book over 1,500 years, do you think you'd be able to find a contradiction, just men doing this? You'd find contradictions on every page. Really, because of how fallible man is. So, you know, what we, what we walk away from this and what we see is, once again, the fact that, that this is an argument that atheists use and try to say, hey, we've proved a contradiction. No, we can put this together using, using methods of interpretation from the Bible itself and how people you know, at that time named one another and all of that. We can put a system together where it makes perfect sense with the, with the list and the little bit of a difference. Just like we see the, the little bit of a difference in the names above the cross of Jesus. But do all of them come together and flow together perfectly? Perfectly. 100% perfectly. So once again, you just show that this thing is just, it's undefeatable. The, if that's the best you got, I mean, step back and think about that. That's the best that they have. 
just proves that this is the truly preserved and pure Word of God. You may have a different interpretation of how to explain you know, uh, the wives and the seemingly, the difference, what seems to be the difference there. But the fact that you can prove that is shadowed out, that it's, that it is, uh, you can't prove that it's a contradiction, and you can, and, and a lot of it can make sense, that just strengthens my faith in the Word of God. What it does is, uh, God wants you to study. If everything, may, you know, was just like you sat down, and it was just on the surface, straightforward, it made perfect sense the first time you, you read it, why read the Bible again? Why read the Bible? How many times have you read something and it seemed like it contradicted and seemed like it didn't make sense and then later on you find out, I was wrong. That actually made perfect sense. Now I see in the Bible how people do this, this, and this. That makes perfect sense why that was worded such a way. So, we just, you know, I walk away from this seeing, you know, the Bible, the King James Bible is amazing. And we can just learn from these types of uh, uh, what, you know, seems to be differences. All the differences in the Bible, let, I don't want to ramble on too much longer, but let me use a perfect example of this. The New Testament, the old, uh, the, the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Oftentimes it uses a little bit of a different word, doesn't it? Does that bother you? Did it maybe bother you the first time you saw it? It might have if you remembered. But now, can't you tell that it's very clearly systematic and it's, and it's meant to teach you something? Like, hey, you know, uh, the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. The Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel. What do you walk away? Hey, good tidings is the gospel. Right? Doesn't it? Well, you know what you walk away with tonight? Mehalath is a whole Obama. That's a possibility, right? So I hope, I hope that made sense to you. I hope that that maybe settled some of the thoughts that you had in your mind. Maybe if you think that I'm wrong, that's perfectly fine. Maybe this will set you on the path to figuring out the truth on actually what the uh, correct interpretation is. There's not many other options when you really lay it on the table, but uh, I believe the four wife model or four wives model makes the most sense. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for the